Good. All right, so uh, let's get going on this. Um, we'll be now doing separation of uh, sequencing of separation trains. And um, essentially, we'll first learn about what, what kind of separation you will need to use in what circumstances. Now, I haven't in the past really shown you these steps in process design. Um, the first thing is assess the primitive problem. Now, the primitive problem is this problem where I say, um, make 100,000 tons per annum of um, vinyl chloride monomer. And th that is th that is that defines a primitive problem, the, the very first problem that you're going to go ahead with. And that is similar to what I'm going to be giving you uh, as a CPJ problem at the beginning of next semester. So with that CPJ problem, with that primitive problem, you will be developing a base case, which, which means that you are finally arriving at a process flow diagram exactly like you did in your first semester test. Um, so, and that is essentially this development of the base case. But let me see. You can't see a, a, um, my pointer, so I must use one of these things like that, development of the base case. Um, this development of the base case is essentially what CPS uh, 410 is all about. Okay, so um, part of that is in developing that base case, we needed to um, we needed to learn some uh, heuristics because as in the process of going through those five steps of process creation, uh, you need to have some background of how to make these decisions that you need to make as you go through. Um, at the moment, we are now going to uh, algorith algorithmic methods, which are different to the um, to the heuristics, uh, and that means that there's a there's a formula that you can fo you can follow uh, to arrive at at the right answer. Okay. Um, So again, development of the base case is create a process flow sheet, process integration, detailed database, pilot plant testing, simulation model. And so this, the first two bits over here uh, is essentially where CPS comes in. And part of CPS, uh, part of the CPS uh, 410 is the separation train synthesis. And um, in the second semester, we will be doing the heat and power integration. So that is that is virtually the whole of the CPS 420 is heat and power integration. So that gives you an idea of where we stand uh, in the whole uh, where CPS 410 uh, stands. Okay, so all, almost all chemical processes require some sort of separation. So either you need to purify the reactive feed, uh, but most likely uh, it is to recover unreacted species to recycle to the reactor. Remember that uh, in the semester test, uh, there was the um, there was the ethanol that we needed to recycle. Because if we didn't recycle it, we would need much more than just the 3.57 kilomoles per hour that, that, we, that we did need. We would need 3.57 divided by 0 0.8, the conversion, if we did not recover the ethanol. And finally, to separate and purify the product from a reactor. So essentially, the two products that we make are ethylene and uh, water and water, uh, 
and we need to separate those because the, the product that we want is the ethylene. So uh, number three is probably the most important and common of the uh, separation methods. So frequently the major investment and operating costs of a process will be the costs associated with the separation equipment. When you do separation, let's, let's first think of exergy or uh, entropy and mixing. Consider uh, two different gases in two flasks. If you mix these two gases, there's a, there's a big change in the randomness of the system. And therefore, there's a, a lot of entropy is being created. Now, if you wanted to go from that mixed system back to the original system, you will have to add energy to overcome the exergy, uh, overcome the entropy that was created. And that's why, um, that's why separation is a very expensive and energy intensive operation. So you both need your distillation column or whatever the equipment might be and you need to use energy to actually make sure that the to separate those two components or multi-components okay for a binary mixture it may be possible to select a separation method that can accomplish it in just one piece of equipment however more commonly the feed mixture involves more than two components and therefore you need more complex separation systems Okay, so this is this is an example. If we have a look at the, uh, and this is this is the type of thing that you're going to be getting in tests and exams, uh, where I give you a list of components. I will tell you what is the. Uh, I will give you vapor pressures of those components, so you can work out relative volatilities, and also the flow rate because the relative flow rates are also important uh, in deciding what your separation process is going to look like. All right, so we give a feed with a certain composition. Uh, the components have physical properties, which I will also give, and then you put them to a separation process, and the, the idea is to get out propane and pentane, so that's C C3 at the top here, C5 at the bottom there, and then of the C4s, we want to separate butane from the butenes. Okay, so let's have a look at these components. We, we have propane, we have one butene, N butene, N butane, that we want to separate, and we have trans 2 butene and cis 2 butene. And these are written in the these are listed in order of relative volatility with the most volatile by convention the most volatile you will always write at the top all right so let's just jump straight to what the answer is in the design for butene's recovery the first the first bit you separate C3 and 1 butene in the distillate. So, so what comes out in the distillate over here is, um, is the propane and the 1 butene. And therefore, in the, next, in the next separation column, you can separate the propene from the 1 butene. Now you come down further and now you've got all butenes and the one butene and the pentane and so the next distillation column it makes sense that you can remove the pentane because it will have a relatively high relative volatility compared to any of the butanes or butenes so the next step removing the pentane now we have all the butanes and but all the butenes and the n butane going into the next section. 
And here you have a problem because the relative volatility. Uh, oh wait, wait! I've got I've got some feedback. Oh, it's just disappeared. Oh, it's too late to see that feedback. Let me see what that means. Uh, confused. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There it is, confused. So what we're trying to do with this section, sequencing of distillation columns, you saw a little bit of it in the semester test. Here we do have a sequence of distillation columns. Um, when I'm showing this first distillation column, I'm showing the, the bottom section separate from the top section. One is called a rectifying and the other one is called a stripping. Um, uh, so this is just one distillation column and here's a second distillation column and what we what we're doing is i'm showing you a sequence um and ultimately we'll be working towards methods to actually arrive at this particular sequence of 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 separating a certain mixture okay so when we once we once we've taken off the C3 and the C5, at this point in the process, we've only got C4s. But the C4s have got very similar um, uh, relative volatilities. But because the betines have got that pi bond, they are more polar than the N-butane. So if we add a polar molecule, and in this case, we're going to add furfural. We add this polar molecule, and then the butenes will tend to uh, come out with the furfural. In other words, the furfural will make the butenes uh, less volatile. And therefore, we can actually uh, get out the N-butane with far fewer um, stages on our distillation column uh, to arrive at this n-butane and now we've separated the n-butane from the butenes the trouble is we've added furfural so this last distillation column is where we where we recover the furfural and that furfural goes back up into the system and the furfural is in a continuous loop and 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 uh, okay, it's going this way and comes down and there's your there's your furfural um, butene uh, separation. So the butenes come off to the, the top and then you get your butenes and the furfural is coming off at the bottom and going back into the system. So the furfural is doing this loop. And none of the furfural is being used up except that you'll probably get some furfural that, uh, that will come off with the butenes just due to inefficiencies, and therefore you'll have a makeup of furfural into the system. So there'll be a tank over here that will, that will have furfural in, and as the tank gets empty, you'll need to add some more. Okay, so furfural is called an extractive distillation agent. So when we try to do ordinary distillation to separate N-butane N from the butenes, we had an alpha of 1.03. That's the uh, relative volatility, 1.03. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you've all heard of the relative volatility in your mass transfer course. And um, as soon as we added furfural, the relative volatility of the, of the butenes from the butane uh, change to 1.17, which is perfectly good to be able to do a distillation with. Okay, and then we had the NC4, which is removed over here as a distillate. And, and there we've done our separation. We've done the entire separation that we wanted to do. Okay. So, we must learn the techniques. And we've just learned a technique, and that was adding that uh, the furfural as a separating agent, as an extractive distillation separating agent. 
So unlike the spontaneous mixing of chemical species, the separation requires expenditure of some sort of energy because spontaneous mixing uh, causes an increase in entropy and, and to get it back into the previous situation, you actually have to add energy. Separation of a feed mixture into streams of different chemical composition is achieved by forcing the different species into different spatial locations. Yeah, this is the language of our textbook. <laughs> it means if you boil a mixture, uh, that where the vapor comes off is in a in a different space to where the liquid is, and therefore are separate. Uh, by one or more of a combination of four common industrial techniques. So creation of heat transfer, shaft work, or pressure reduction. Uh, a second phase that is immiscible with the feed phase. And where we say immiscible, think just think liquid versus vapor. Okay, and, and because we added energy, for instance, boiling this liquid, uh, it's an energy separation, uh, separating agent. We've added energy to boil the liquid and the vapor came off at a different spatial location. The vapor came off and could be condensed in a different place. So we have now separated using an energy separation agent. The introduction, the second way of doing it is introduction into the system of a second fluid phase, mass separating agent, and that must subsequently be removed. So that furfural is a mass separating agent because we had to add an, a different, that's a, well, second fluid phase. Um, I think uh, maybe a mass separating agent will be something like adding water to a an aqueous system and then you get liquid phases and uh, that would that would be a more common mass separating agent and then that must subsequently be removed so if you go back to the furfural example we have to remove it again because we're adding it as a as a mass mm, as a mass flow into the system and it has to be subsequently removed so that you can get the original separation that happened. The addition uh, of, yes, yes. Um, isn't the mass separating agent something like a stripping column or a liquid liquid extraction type of thing where the one is more so with a separating agent? The um, no. species you want to separate is more soluble in one or the other. No, that's not really that's not really it um, okay because if you have a stripping column all of the components that were that you originally wanted to separate are, are going into that same column it's only when you add a different component that that we're talking about a mass separating agent oh, okay, okay so it's cool. so, so yeah stripping and absorption are two similar operations uh, that are not the same as distillation because you don't have the re, uh, reflux. Okay, so yes, the um, furfural is a mass separating agent and it must be subsequently removed. But another mass separating agent is, uh, is when you add, for instance, water to an organic system and then you get a new equilibrium of, of things that are that are uh, dissolving the, some of the organic compounds like uh, ethanol, if there is ethanol in the organic mixture, it will tend to go into the water. It will dissolve in the water and you'd actually get a separation of the ethanol away from the, from the original organic mixture. So in that case, water would be a mass separating agent in that system. Um, and then you can add a solid phase for adsorption, and remember that adsorption is different to absorption. If you've got a um, stripping and a, what's the other column, absorption column, that is where you're absorbing a gas into a liquid, and as soon as it's onto a solid, it's called adsorption. 
And then finally, uh, the placement of a membrane barrier. And we will look at that as well, and what are the principles behind membrane separation. Okay, so those are the four methods. Um, one and uh, number one is typically distillation. Number two can be distillation or liquid liquid extraction, and then uh, adsorption and membrane separation. And membrane separation can occur in liquids and it can occur in gases. Hmm. Right. So I'm just going to carry on with these slides. I just want to show you quickly common in industrial separation methods. And there are a few slides where we will discuss these things. That's the third slide. OK, so I'm going to go back to the first slide. Equilibrium flash. So this, the, the first two, equilibrium flash and distillation, everybody's familiar with difference in volatility, separation pool. So we developed a vapor phase or a liquid phase. If we, um, if we have a liquid, we boil it, we have a vapor phase. We can have a liquid and have a pressure reduction and therefore, um, and therefore flash off some of the components as vapor. So you can, you could, you'll have a developed phase called, which is a vapor. If you compress using shaft work, you also can uh, develop a liquid from a vapor. Right, so distillation is exactly the same. It's just that with distillation, you, you, um, you will have several of these processes in series, uh, one on top of the other, and you can get repeated further separation, which you're all familiar with. Right, here's that word absorption, and absorption is when you are using a liquid absorbent. So you are you've got a you've got a vapor. And you want to absorb a certain component out of that vapor, you'll have a liquid absorbent. It will absorb into the liquid, and the rest of the of the vapor uh, will exit the column. So again, that is due to a difference in volatility, um, where the where the component that you want to absorb is 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 less volatile, it will tend to absorb in that liquid. Stripping, you've got a liquid and you are trying to strip off a component from that liquid by, put, by uh, contacting it with a vapor that's coming from the opposite direction. And again, it is a difference in volatility that where the separation occurs. Extractive distillation is where we use the furfural. You can put in feed as a vapor or a liquid, and then you have a liquid solvent which will change the relative volatility of certain components, and that's so therefore it's still a difference in volatility, and the developed or added phase can be vapor or liquid because it's happening in a distillation column. Azeotropic distillation, uh, is something that we're going to go into in much more detail later in the in the module, and that's where we will start using um, residue curves uh, because that's a much more powerful tool in order to understand uh, what is possible and what is not possible in an azeotropic type of mixture. All right. So again, it is liquid or vapor, um, liquid in container and heat transfer and the, and again it's a difference in volatility so i don't want to go into this thing about the liquid entrainer you can use a mass a mass separating agent to help break an, an azeotrope but also you can simply use a uh, difference in pressure uh, you can use pressure uh, pressure swing distillation to break an azeotrope, but we'll go into that later. Okay, next slide. Liquid-liquid extraction. 
we've talked about that again is a is a mass separating agent uh, a liquid solvent and now you get two liquid phases happening um, I want to draw something now uh, which you might have seen in we got blue there we go uh, in your um, in chemistry labs I don't know if you're familiar with a flask that looks something like this oops <laughs> and then you put liquid in there it's got a it's got a little valve at the bottom here and oops and then you put liquid in there you can shake up that liquid and ultimately you get the liquid separating into two phases and oops no i don't want that thing there yes there we go and the uh, water will typically be the dense phase and organic will be the, the, the uh, less dense phase it will sit in the top and then you can pour off the liquid the the water the aqueous phase uh, by opening that valve and stopping that valve as soon as this interface reaches the valve so that's exactly the same principle as what you would use in liquid liquid extraction uh, on a continuous scale um, so it may be that you need to add a second liquid again that example of having a a mixture of organics that includes an alcohol inside it and if you add water the water will almost certainly go into a separate phase and the alcohol will tend to prefer being dissolved in the in the water compared to being dissolved in the um, in the original organic and so therefore the separate principle is a difference in solubility because we're not talking about vapor liquid equilibrium anymore the difference of so insolubility of the alcohol in water versus alcohol in the organic mixture all right now we get into the solid type of um wait let me get my pointer again there we go here are the developed or added phases of the solid phases and the first one is crystallization if you've got a liquid with a dissolved solid uh, you can heat up that and you can evaporate the liquid we've talked about that in the in a previous lecture about um, whether you are going to boil off um, use evaporation or whether to cool down and then uh, uh, allow the solid to crystallize uh, in that way so it's heat transfer uh, and you get a solid being formed and that's because there's a difference in solubility or melting point um, so if you boil off water eventually you get a super saturated solution and you start getting uh, crystallization or else you cool it down and the solubility will decrease and you'll get crystallization is happening as well Right, gas adsorption is a solid adsorbent. The phase of the feed is vapor, so you can actually adsorb. Uh, and, and we talked about, um, for instance, um, molecular sieves as an example of doing gas adsorption because molecular sieves have got pores that are nano sized, therefore, they can filter out they are small enough to filter out big molecules and so there's a difference in adsorbability of the component if the component that you want to adsorb is got a high adsorbability it will it will stay with the solid material and the rest of the gas will will move through and similarly there's liquid adsorption uh, with uh, a solid adsorbent and again difference in adsorbability finally we've got our membranes and that's a that's an interesting concept about how to use membranes because the driving force across a membrane 
is going to be, especially with gases, with gases, the driving force is the concept, the, is the partial pressure of that component on the one side of the membrane versus the other side of the membrane. Um, and then the the constant, the um, the constant that you're talking about is the permeability and solubility. It's ex it's essentially the same thing. There'll be a permeation constant, and 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 the rate at which permeation occurs is proportional to the difference in uh, partial pressure in gases and the difference in the concentration of that component if it's uh, uh, between two liquids. Okay. Supercritical extraction. Uh, that's when you have a supercritical solvent. Uh, carbon dioxide is often used for that because it is supercritical at around 30 degrees C and 80 bar pressure. Uh, so that's a decent thing, and and it when you're in, in supercritical conditions, uh, you could have a big difference in solubility. So one of the methods that I like very much uh, is when you can you can extract hop components uh, components out of hops uh, that add the bitterness in beer. Um, and then you leave behind all of the cellulose and all the other things you don't want uh, by dissolving the hops leaves uh, in supercritical CO2. And then when you release the pressure, only the CO2 boils off and you're left with a, um, you're left with a resin, essentially, that is very useful for, for the brewing process. Um, right, and then there's the last two is where the phase of the feed is solid and you want to get off, uh, for instance, if you've got in the mining industry and you take out ore from the ground and you want to extract the gold or you want to extract the copper, you can put a liquid solvent, you can dissolve whatever it is you want to dissolve using acid for instance and uh, the acid will cause the desired component which might be copper it might be iron it might be gold to dis to dissolve in the acid and the difference of course then is insolubility because the rest of the ore is typically oxides metal oxides and they don't dissolve easily in acid Okay, so that's leaching when you've got a solid and you want to dis you want to extract various components out of that solid. And finally, drying. If you've got a solid and a liquid, a wet solid, in other words, you could use heat transfer uh, to evaporate the water. So it's simply a difference in volatility. And there you have your separation. Okay, so those so, are yes. Uh, just quickly, um, so on the leaching topic, when they say when they speak about a uh, leaching efficiency, what can you maybe explain what a bit a bit about that? Yeah, that's going that's going technically uh, that's going deep deeper technically in in that if you think of an ore, um, it will contain grains that have different different. Um, essentially solid phases in them and uh, you can extract certain uh, let's think of a of an example in the chemist in the in the chemical engineering department and that is flogger part uh, we're looking at extracting various components out of the flogger part the flogger part contains potassium it contains iron it contains magnesium, uh, aluminium, and we want to extract using different pHs the various components, but you'd, you're going to only extract a certain amount of those components 
uh, and then let's say let's say at the highest acidity, the lowest pH, you extract you tend to extract uh, let's say potassium. Um, the, the lower the pH goes, the the, uh, the 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 more efficient it is. You'll get out all of your potassium, but then you start extracting out some of the other components as well. So there's an efficiency involved in that. Um, you can also define the leaching efficiency as how much potassium is left in the original ore, uh, in the original solid. So yeah, um, it's very dependent on the system that you're talking about. Okay, should we move on? Right, selection of a separation method. Oh good, you're happy. <laughs> I like these. I like these uh, emoticons, but I must just remember to look there. Right, selecting a separation, so, the development of a separation. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so yeah. yesterday we fit, uh, I just quickly want to make everybody aware of these emoticons. Um, so it's at the bottom, right next to your microphone, there are a couple of options you can click. So if you are confused or happy or sad, or um, if you want, the lecture to go faster, slower. There are a couple of these, and he gets a summary of the different things. So that was a cool feature we figured out yesterday. Thanks, Yakiri. Okay, so um, separation process requires the selection of uh, separation methods that we just discussed whether you're using uh, energy separation agents or mass separating agents, the separation equipment. Um, an example is, remember, I'll stop for that one. Somebody raise their hand. Would you like to? Would you like to ask something? Maybe it was, maybe it was just a uh, finger trouble. Uh, separating equipment is the example is whether you're going to use a um, partial condenser or not. That would be a different piece of separating equipment. Um, the optimal arrangement or sequencing of the equipment that's something you've come to terms with a little bit in our uh, in our first semester test. Um, the optimal operating temperature and pressure for the equipment. Again, that's something you come to terms with. For the pressure, the, the pressure at which you operate your distillation column will determine what is the temperature at the top and what is the temperature at the bottom. Oh, what is that emoticon? That is slowed down, I think. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> All right, never mind, never mind too much about these things. We're gonna go into these uh, in detail, the, these five points that we're talking about at the moment here, we're going to go into in more detail as we go through the through the course. Right, selection of separation method depends largely on the feed condition. Uh, for vapor, you will use partial condensation, distillation, absorption, adsorption, or gas permeation membranes. So those are the different methods you can use. If you've got a vapor and you need to separate the components out of the vapor. And they probably listed in about uh, the most common sequence. Most likely partial condensation or distillation or absorption or adsorption. We try to avoid adsorption on, on the large scale because it's difficult working with the flow of solids. Right, so if it's a liquid, the most common thing will be distillation or stripping or liquid liquid extraction. Supercritical extraction is not that common. And then as soon as we have to pour solids, it's from the liquid, it's crystallization, adsorption, dialysis or reverse osmosis. That's dialysis and reverse osmosis are very similar. Right, solid. 
If it's wet, you need drying. And if it's dry, you need leaching to pull off those specific components you're looking for. Easy enough. All right, now we get into some formal definitions. And this is the last bit before our lecture must come to an end. All right, separating factor. You've come across in mass transfer um, this alpha, which is the relative volatility. We're going to define a separating factor, which is in some cases the same as the relative volatility, but a separating factor can be used in terms of liquid liquid extraction. It can be it is more it is can be used where you don't have ideal mixtures. So that's why we're defining a separating factor rather than we talk than talking about relative volatilities from the beginning. Relative volatility is simply a special uh, case of, of the separating factor. Okay, so we define a separating factor as the composition in one of the phases, the composition of component one in one of the phases divided by the, com the composition of variable of, of, of component two in that same phase. The ratio of the, of the concentration in the two different phases in the of the components in the same phase divided by the ratio of the two components in the other phase. So those two phases, Roman I, Roman I, Roman II, can be vapor versus liquid, and it can be uh, liquid one versus liquid two, the organic liquid versus the non-organic, the aqueous phase. Okay, so, yeah. The, the separating factor is generally limited by thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, for example, in the case of distillation, using mole fractions, letting phase I, phase one be the vapor, phase two the liquid, the limiting value of, of the separating factor is in terms of vapor liquid equilibrium ratios, the K values, which is that Y1 over X1, that's essentially those two, divided by Y2 over X2, and those are the, the K values, and that is your, um, your relative volatility of one versus two. And as soon as you've got an liquid or vapor, that is the, the vapor pressures of the two, the ratio of the vapor pressures. Okay, so essentially, this is just, the importance of this is only to say, we, we, we're mainly going to be using relative volatilities, but note that it is possible to have, um, th that there's a more general definition so that we can use so that we can use liquid liquid systems as well. And the other reason that we do that is to say the separating factor is if you have got non ideal solutions, then it is no longer just the ratio of the vapor pressures, you need to put in the um, the gamma the activity of the two components as well. You've got to include that. And that will give you your relative volatility between these two components. If a mass separating agent is used to create two liquid phases, such as liquid liquid extraction, SF is referred to as the relative selectivity, beta rather than relative volatility, because of course with two liquid phases you don't have volatility, it's not the operating principle. So we talk about relative selectivity of of the components in the organic phase versus in the in the aqueous phase, and again you'd have to use the the activity coefficients uh, to understand where how that separation occurs. In general, mass separating agents for extractive distillation 
and liquid liquid extraction are selected according to their ease of recovery for recycle and to achieve relatively large values of the separating factor. Okay, so I'm going to stop it here. I'll just show you the next slide. And that is equal cost separators. Whether you're going to be using liquid liquid extraction, adding a mass separating agent for liquid liquid extraction, or whether you're going to use extractive distillation, or whether you're going to use ordinary distillation. Uh, this graph will give you equal cost separators uh, if you take a, a separation that's got a um, relative volatility of two with extractive distillation your minimum alpha should be to three and a half and if you're going to use liquid liquid extraction your separating factor should be uh, 20. Okay, but we'll, 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 we'll carry on from this lecture um, at the next lecture. I'm going to switch off recording now.